Excellent. Well, okay. thank you very much. Um, so I'm speaking with Miranda Brown, the Arthur F. Bernal um, Professor and Professor of Chinese Studies in the Asian Languages and Cultures Faculty of the University of Michigan. We're talking about her paper, How Did Milk Become an Ethnic Food? Of terroir and Minzu Tai. So hello, Miranda. Hello. <laughs> um, it's an absolutely wonderful paper. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just dive right in and ask you the first question, which is, um, what is the central question you, you address in the paper or you, you attempt to kind of shape in the paper? Well, I'm not sure it's going to stay the central question. So that, that and this is what happens with, when we write, especially as historians. Um, but you know, I, I I've been I've been tackling this stereotype in China for a long time, right? And it's a, one that sort of informs the way that Western journalists and scholars talk about Chinese food, which is that there's this idea that Chinese food is dairy free, at least traditionally. And now we are now in this very sort of aberrational moment where they're starting to copy Western eating habits, right? And sort of consume food like Westerners, or they would say maybe sort of like sort of pe pastoral peoples that were considered barbarians. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been very interested in that stereotype of that, you know, Chinese or Han Chinese in our sort of modern speak, um, don't consume dairy. Um, and, I'm, and that's just not true from a, the perspective of historical materials. We know that, um, you know, people consumed dairy in North China, um, historically in the early medieval period when the conditions were right. Um, we know that rich people who could afford dairy consumed it. Um, we knew that powerful people consumed dairy um, and people who were living in places where dairy production was, you know, really made sense, consumed dairy. So then how do we get into the 20th century or the 21st century and get this idea that this is not a Chinese food? So I was interested in not so much sort of fighting the stereotype, but understanding its sort of origins, you know, its genesis. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the sort of, that was the main sort of question that guided um, sort of the, well, I guess the sort of first draft. Oh, fantastic. Well, I mean, um, you know, the way you approach it, and you'll talk a little bit more about this yourself, of course, but, you know, you draw from a kind of a, a rich trove of sources, you know, you start, I mean, I guess, considering your sort of um, medical background, your your previous research, it makes sense to have started with the, um, with the Huangdi uh, Neijing. Um, and then you you travel from the Han Dynasty all the way right through to the Republican period. Um, so I just wondered, how, how did you choose the sources you ended up um, enriching your paper with and you know what, what kind of choices did you make around that well yeah so that, that there's a section where i wanted to kind of briefly go over um sort of this idea that you know milk consumption is tied to place um you know i picked basically a few sources i've been working on previously that i think were kind of in some ways seminal work so there's a famous sort of episode in a text called the shi shuo xin yu um which is you know from the mid sixth century, um, or maybe fifth, I can't remember, it's too early here. But the basic idea is that that's where the stereotype that Northerners like like their sheep or goat sort of yogurt and Southerners eat their sort of fishy stews comes from. And that that's the seminal stereotype. I mean, like this, the thing about the Chinese literary tradition is it's a bit of an echo chamber, right? You get sort of this one famous anecdote that's in a sort of authoritative text, and then next thing you know, there's all these poetic riffs for centuries, right? And so I thought it was good to explain that riff, that's where that stereotype came from. And then, you know, you, don't, you can't go over the next thousand years of riffs, but it's something that I noticed that, you know, you find very much, you know, sort of in play in the Song Dynasty and still in play in the Qing Dynasty. And what's really interesting is that you find that poetic riff, even in periods where, you know, dairy consumption, the centers of dairy consumption are in the places like Tiananmen, that right mm -hmm. and people are kind of addressing that so mm -hmm. that's that was my idea was to think about the sort of you know sort of the authoritative text that people sort of you know engage with right rather than trying to do something that's very well you can't do a comprehensive study it would be dull and also just not feasible <laughs> so that, that was my thinking for you know the pre-modern sort of like sort of like background right I mean obviously there's always a level of selection there course and actually I mean the story that you end up telling with this with this selection is wonderful you know you 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 intimated at the beginning or you mentioned it at the beginning you know that dairy consumption it might not uh, you know it is it, it's it's widespread but it's located right and you mentioned the class you know it's located in class certain elites um consume it but then you know uh, 
now entering this idea of terroir that you you start to explore in your paper it's also very much located in the minds of people who eat it and and in you know the the ideas of those people who uh, live in those regions as very much a northern food so um did you did you approach did you come up uh, to terroir through these readings or did it seem to be a concept that guided your um, selections your readings your understandings of the literature How well, so this is where the historians right we probably work from the sources up um, you know I, I had initially thought about this sort of framing as, as a sort of logic of place right and I understood place you know from you know and, and this is already you know there in the Huangdi Neijing right but also much more so in later texts right where like um, Huainan also has a discussion of like food and place, right? Um, the topography of the area. And this is very, very clear later on. Um, so I, you know, but I didn't attach or I didn't associate with the term Tehua because, you know, in Chinese, it's a different sort of way. Of, it's slightly different, but I think it actually works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe this is something I have to revisit at some point. But yeah, I do think that the Tehua label came kind of late in the writing process as I was thinking like, what? what's the label that I want to sort of associate it with? Um, because it is about land. And, you know, in the French case, from what I understand it also, it's, you know, a way of understanding peoplehood, right? Um, not so much through genetics, but through their connection to a land or kind of a specific place that produces certain kinds of foods that in some ways produce a kind of person, right? And mm -hmm. that I think is kind of an interesting way of thinking about, you know, sort of the production of identity um, and difference potentially. Mm, absolutely it was it was uh, brilliantly done and and you know it and it's never that simple is it you know the the representations of bucolic peasantry <laughs> that come up that you know that get generated by this idea of terroir you know that also has to be unpacked and situated and and you, you do it brilliantly and and you know you start the paper with this uh wonderful um account um from uh i i i uh, it's about, I think it's an account of Fatima Binti um, Ali uh, Koltan, you know, the story of her and how she ended up being um, a consort in the uh, Qing Emperor um, uh, uh, Palace uh, and, you know, that the, the, how she was taken from the chieftain and then transported into um, the imperial palace, uh, but then kept, you know, her fragrance was what was the most enticing thing about her as well as her beauty. And so in order to keep that fragrance on her, you know, they, they, they fed her milk and yogurts and dairy foods just to make sure that she was as as beautiful um uh you know as rumor had it so it it's you know there is this sense then i guess that personhood is very much a uh, personhood and place is very much interconnected here um that story kind of does 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 some of that work which i thought was great and um, what so was that what was the most fascinating detail that then came out of um, the work that you did, the research that you've done for this paper? What, what kind of uh, tidbits did you encounter doing this? Well, I, I guess, and, and this, I'm not probably really qualified to speak, but, you know, I think for me, the most interesting aspects were the ethnographic encounters where, you know, I'm out there in Yunnan where, you know, you have the remnants of an, a much broader cheese making culture that, you know, I think survives in a few spots in the Southeast, but really, you know, the Southwest is best known for it. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the topography mm. um, and the way that people are still talking about the, you know, milk production, you know, especially at the very local level, um, not the most educated people, you know, in terms of terroir, instead of like, you know, this ethnic group makes this and this is this ethnic group's food. So what was really striking to me was that the way that, you know, you know, your cab drivers talking about the grass in this specific location, and that's why they make the cheese, because um, mm -hmm. the water and the grass and the hills. And that, you know, I think that's actually at some level more spot on than this idea that, you know, you know, foods are owned by ethnic groups, right? Like, because we all know that this sort of ethnic identities are highly artificial and, mm -hmm. You know, and so that's actually the aspects of sort of Chinese sort of one of the aspects of China that I, I don't sort of enjoy the most, right? <laughs> is that kind of I would consider sort of essentializing and, and simplistic way of talking about food. But I'm also wondering if that way of talking about food, how deeply it whether it really whether it interacts with this older notion of Tewa or whether you know Tewa is stronger, I suspect it's probably the latter. Um, especially at some of these places that are kind of far off. Um, 
So that's something I've just been thinking is that as I read modern Chinese stuff, you know, I, I keep coming back to the conversations I had with cab drivers and, and people who had been in the military who were peasants or who were vendors is that, you know, they usually talk about the grass in this specific location as being good for keeping the cattle or the buffaloes fat and the milk rich. And that that's a very ancient way of talking about it. And also one that's really about resources, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and habitats and sort of ecological opportunity. And that, that to me, you know, rings true because we Americans, especially in this idea that you can, you can have whatever you want to eat wherever you are, right? Irrespective of the place and what's actually makes sense in terms of the soil or the climate. And maybe we need to go back to that idea that, you know, there's certain places, certain diets make more sense, right? Mm-hmm. Given the limitations of the land. Absolutely. Um, and so I don't know if I, I mean, you know, I, Obviously, that comes with certain. That's maybe naive on my part, but I, I thought about that because as an American, that is really it's hard to wrap your mind around the idea that you know kale doesn't grow in Minnesota like in December, <laughs> or that you know mangoes. Our ancestors were not eating mangoes in 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 England, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right? It just doesn't make sense, or that milk production doesn't make sense everywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, to bin, you know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. the cows die, you know, yeah. in the heat. <laughs> yeah. And then there are alpine cultures where, you know, you, you milk at certain times of the day, certain times of the year. So, you know, all these things are very situated, very seasonal, uh, very geographically um, determined. Absolutely. I mean, going back to your eth- uh, your ethnographic vignette that you sort of ended the paper with, I thought that was wonderful. You know, um, that, that, you know, uh, that kind of uh, light touch survey of the people that you encountered on that road to Dali from Kunming um, was brilliant. Uh, and you also mentioned that, you know, you, you did pass by and talk with a few vendors who also had an opinion about, you know, cheese making <laughs> and who was best placed to make it and who was it for, right. who, you know, um, and I thought that was wonderful because it does sort of show you the collapse between these production side dynamics around terroir and then the, you know, the consumption side, you know, that, that there's a kind of false distinction and people have you know they have experiences of both and you know it's it's um it was really interesting and it kind of brought me and this is probably my you know my last question really is how your research question fits into broader studies of other research it brought me to mind um brought to mind um studies around cheese and and artisan cheese in America, Heather Paxson's book on um, on cheese making and how she she transposes terroir uh, from a from the, the French context to the to the American context and sort of looks at, you know, and, and problem problematizes it a little bit, you know, she she looks at, you know, um, okay, yes, of course, it's about landscapes, but also it's about task scapes and, and who gets to uh, produce cheese in a way that is the antithesis of industrial production. And I mm-hmm. wanted to ask you, is there, do you think your, your vignettes from 2017 speak to this wider um, desire for, uh, among Chinese eaters for a more, buco- a more you know, a, a less industrial food system? Or it, it, was that something that you felt that these people touched on? <laughs> I mean, there are two things, right? One is that, I mean, my, my friend is in, in major cities, you know, <laughs> will say to me, you know, you haven't had yak milk. And I'm like, no, you need to try yak milk. It's so much better. And we, we, we in China don't really trust all that mass produced stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and actually the weird thing about China is there's a far greater variety of dairy products that are available on the market than, I mean, for a for non-milk eating population, they sure have opinions about where the best milk comes from <laughs> and um and also secondly you know that they have a lot more they, they understand that it's more than cows right mm-hmm. i mean it's not just my five-year-old who thinks it's surprising that sheep make milk i mean most americans just don't seem to understand that you can get milk from mammals other than women and, and cows right so <laughs> well said. there's there's that right i mean we've discovered right. goats oh my goodness right but that's it um you can't get anything else i've tried um <laughs> Right. So there's there's Thank definitely you. that sense, which is there's a, you know, obviously in response to the milk scandal, there's mm-hmm. a lot of nervousness around industrial produced stuff. And then, of course, you have all of this community supported agriculture. And, you know, this is for mm-hmm. people of a certain class, you know, understandably, right, mm-hmm. who are very body focused, right, mm-hmm. um, and health focused. Um, mm-hmm. So there's that's one element of this. Um you know, and that I think intersects really nicely with this sort of tradition of food connoisseurship, which is alive. Right. I mean, every time someone goes on a trip, they want to know what the local food specialty is. That goes back to the gazetteers. It's an old 
old, old practice, you know, um, and that has, and food connoisseurship, as we all know, is very old in China. And, you know, and it kind of went on this sort of down low for a while, but it's back. Um, and it's very much a part of Chinese masculinity, especially for Southern Chinese men or people living in the East. And, you know, I think of China as the land of the, the world's first metrosexuals, right? It's a joke because I'm sure it's other in other places, but just not America. Um, we're coming to <laughs> everything very late, right? Um, so there's that, right? And then there's a second question I have, which is the way that the government goes in and tries to tame, or um, how would you say, sort of domesticate some of these local milk producers. So that was one conversation I didn't talk about in the paper, which I did have, which is that, you know, sometimes I'd go to... A, you know, a vendor in Kunming, and they would tell me that, oh, you know, these milk fans are illegal. And what it means is that people weren't necessarily following the regulations. They were pooling their milk. You know, some of the milk products obviously only work with <laughs> um, sort of uh, unpasteurized milk. Mm. I know because I try, I've tried to recreate some of them, and then it only works when I go back to California and I can get my hands on unpasteurized milk, which is one of two states in the United States, would you wear this is legal? Um, and, you know, and I don't have a strong opinion about that stuff, but for reconstructions, I noticed that you kind of have to get the unpasteurized yeah, stuff. Right. <laughs> um, and so obviously there are going to be public health concerns, right? There's mm -hmm. also public health concerns about waste dumping, right, into mm -hmm. the waterway. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the government has tried to get in there to manage, you know, this, you know, the public health concerns as well as the ecological sort of problems that come with, you know, sort of raising cattle mm. and dealing with the waste. Um, and so there is a bit of tension there, right? Mm. Um, with these very local practices and then sort of central mandates. And, mm. you know, I'm not an anthropologist, so I'm not going to critique the government's environmental policies because as an American, I just don't know how you get people to go along, right? I mean, mm. here we have zero commitment from what I can see. <laughs> environmental protection our dairy industry does basically whatever we have plenty of cattle runoff and then we point the finger at china but i can see the tension at the local level right mm. with people who are trying to make a living margins are always thin with mm. like dairy production right it's a constant it's struggle especially day. with the cost of feed mm. um you, you don't want people getting tuberculosis no, no, <laughs> exactly. um so how does that work? Right? That's something I thought about a little bit, um, which is that it's, it is a tough negotiation. So mm. the yuppies love the stuff, but on the other hand, if you're a government official at the local level doing this thankless chat task, you know, you're kind of in the middle. And I think these are both, you know, competing concerns and they're both valid, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's food safety, uh, the environment, these are all um, regulated spaces and, you know, it, and there are, uh, you know, and the artisan communities, you know, whether they're in China or Europe or in the US, you know, there's often, you know, there's there's a kind of fight against a standardization that then takes away the distinct distinctiveness of a product. And so, you know, there's there's this sense that, you know, it, once you sanitize it entirely, then the characteristics of what made it amazing and also, you know, um, not nurturing to produce is also then disappears as well. Um, I just wanted to touch on um, the last part of your paper uh, before we end things. Uh, you, 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 you tantalizingly sort of um, uh, approach this idea of, um, you know, you, you talk about this, the, the genesis of this idea of China not being a milk consuming country. Um, and then you touch upon the missionaries, uh, you know, missionary impact on this idea, you know, from the um, sort of uh, 19th century onwards. Um, and I just wondered, I wondered if you could expand on that just slightly um, in, in the minutes that we have remaining. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that, that might become the paper, the main story of the paper, right? Um, depending on which way I end up going, is this a more of a terroir paper or about the Melchus story, right? Um, I mean, the missionaries are, I mean, like, if you go back to the 17th century, there's no milkless narrative, right? I mean, Matteo Ricci says that the Chinese consume milk and cheese from, from cows, not goats, mm. you know, which is surprising as an Italian or, or bovine, mm. you know, so from Ovid, so that, 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 was, that was his takeaway, right? Others have noticed that, you know, there are certain places where you get a lot more milk, like in the Suzhou is really the milk sort of center. Um, and then, of course, the Dutch are drinking plenty of milk tea, at, you know, in mm. all the bureaus and in the court. Um, so this is definitely not a theme until the 19th century, at which point you get a lot of the slogans like they just don't consume milk. They don't consume mm. milk. Now, 
this is more common at the latter part of this 17th, the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And there are two things going on, which is one is that, you know, in the 18th century, if you go back to like places like England, milk consumption was low, Mm -hmm. especially with the lower class, especially in the South of England. It was like very, very low. They were losing their access to dairy. This is, you know, a documented historical fact. Mm -hmm. So they were probably not surprised if they went on a trip to China to see less milk consumption at the lower Mm. levels of society, because that's familiar to them, right? Mm. I mean, they were drinking their tea without milk, (laughs) you know, so, so, I mean, so this idea, first of all, is that Europeans have always done lots of dairy is just false. It's, Mm. it's always been a matter of access, right? Um, Mm. And industrialization was bad for food in Europe. (laughs) Um, and, and, and similarly in China, in the 18th and 19th century, things were getting tighter too at those sort of you know, lower classes as well. So, Mm -hmm. so I think that what we see in the 19th century is really that the milk industry, especially the second half of it really picks up in China, in in the United States, it really picks up in England, right. Mm -hmm. Um, For a variety of reasons, um, for different reasons, but they, it both does. And so when they get to China, they're a little surprised that there isn't milk in everything. Right. But that's because the Europeans are consuming anomalous amounts historically. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they complain a lot, right. The Europeans are complaining constantly about the lack well, the British and the English about the lack of milk in their diet, the Chinese diet, how they can't get milk for their tea. Mm -hmm. And then some of them actually do notice that there is milk. Um, And this is in Saban's 2013 paper. Um, And they're like, oh, well, but that's just an exception, right? (laughs) But that the strong thesis gets imported home and also becomes, I think, in some ways, a talking bit for the American dairy industry, which some of their evangelists, I like to call them, you know, start to tie milk consumption, which, you know, they're promoting for economic business reasons, right? Mm. Um, with sort of the idea that milk is healthy when we, when of course it's not in this mm. period, everyone knows that. Um, it's always been there and that's also not true. It's also, you know, a marketing ploy. And then also on top of that, it's tied to sort of white supremacy, right? Mm. Um, and so one of these guys actually, can, you know, sort of talks about how the world's divided between the weed eaters basically and then the milk and meat people. Mm. And, you know, we can probably guess how that works out. <laughs> sort of the grand scheme of history mm-hmm. right um but what's interesting is they end up training like sort of dietary reformers in in late 19th century and early 20th century america and, and china right and those guys bring it home with them so i guess i've wondered if that is part of it right which is that mm-hmm. this is maybe in some ways an external discourse that interacts mm-hmm. with you know, Chinese notions of tao wa, which had always seen milk as something that it was situated mm-hmm. Um, that's just a thought, um, you know, maybe it's too neat a story. Um, <laughs> I, that's always a question I have. I mean, I, you know, I, I want, recently talked to my cousin who grew up in the 50, you know, she's born in the late fifties, early sixties. And she talked about how, cause it's not true that Chinese don't eat dairy. I had, and then she goes over and rattles off a bunch of dishes. Right. And then I talked to another friend and from Nanjing and she's like, that's just not true. My grandparents had soft courage. We had rationing, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we wanted it, but we couldn't get it right because yeah. it wasn't available on the market <laughs> yeah. yeah so I, I guess I, that, that that could be a story in itself right which is where does the sort of the, whether the missionaries created the milkless narrative mm. um, which became very dominant with Chinese dietary reformers themselves mm. especially the milk you know pushers mm. oh, this I is mean so it could be that and then that becomes a lens with which everything is interpreted Oh, fantastic. This is this is brilliant. Uh, well, I cannot wait to get uh, stuck into the, your paper in the midst of the conference. So uh, thank you, Miranda, for your time. And uh, yeah, uh, it's been brilliant. And uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.